What we have for you today is a rare creature, one that is rarely found in the wild. A fund manager working for a mainstream asset management company who is an advocate of gold and silver ownership. What a treat. Ned Naylor Leyland is head of strategy in the gold and silver team at Jupiter Asset Management in London. And Ned's views on precious metals and the economy are somewhat refreshing in that he doesn't quite buy into the market's presumption that the Fed will pivot, and nor does he believe that stocks are crashing just yet. For Ned, things could get much, much worse. And yet the Fed may continue to push on, all because of a greater mandate. And we also asked Ned about gold and silver prices, and he admits they are annoying right now. But be sure to listen to his analysis of how these will ultimately work out and why it's all down to the sorcery of forward guidance. For Ned, gold is sound money. It's the optimal savings instrument and one that's risk-free. But he says that gold is not an investment asset. Stay tuned to find out why. And if you enjoy this interview, be sure to share it, tweet it, and hit the like button. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to Goldcore TV? This is one of many brilliant interviews we have for you. And if there's ever a time to be getting as much insight as you can, it's now. Ned Naylor Leyland, welcome to Goldcore TV. Delighted to be here. Fantastic to speak to you today, but I'd like to start by asking you one question. Stocks are crashing and uh, property is under pressure. And also it looks like unemployment is on the rise. Is quantitative tightening over before it even begins? Uh, without wanting to give you a binary yes or no answer, bearing in mind that I'm a fund manager, so I can't give a direct answer to anything. <laughs> um, I think the first kind of comment I'd make on, on what you put across there was, I'm not sure stocks are crashing yet. Um, I'm not saying they're not going to, they've definitely come down. Um, I do think that, that, that it's certainly the view of the market that there will be a pivot towards being dovish again, um, whether that involves giving up entirely on balance sheet runoff and, and, and QT and uh, whether we're on, we end up doing QE again. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the, the exact hurdles are, but it feels like we're closer to um, this, this period of um, hawkish uh, guidance by the Fed being over than, it, than when it started. Having said that, I tend to think to be a little bit provocative. I think that um, systemic change lies ahead of us mm. and, and more of the same, which is kind of, you know, a little bit hawkish and then, and then dovish again, and then a little bit hawkish and then dovish again, mm -hmm. isn't really going to work medium term. So there is a chance the answer to your question is just an outright no, and they're going to let this go further. Do you think um, you see that they, they, they might uh, they might overreach him or, or or they might Powell might decide that he's going to try and embody a, a Volcker style approach to this? Well, I mean, I, I think that, that that's a stretch, um, <laughs> bearing in mind where Volcker took interest rates. But what I mean is that um, there is a need to to if we want to get into a central bank digital currency system, which is not what I want, but it appears to be what the state wants. Mm then I think that a, a substantially greater crisis than the one we're in at the moment would be a likely, um, a likely scenario before that happened. Um, so therefore, allowing a lot more pain um, potentially could be part of the playbook. Uh, and certainly that's the narrative they're trying to push at the moment. I agree the market thinks otherwise. The market thinks we're going to they'll catch it fairly soon and pivot dovish again and don't worry about inflation but I, i'm not so sure i think i think we're in a bit of a different situation right now than where we've been before actually so you think that uh they're looking to engineer um more pain uh on the road to potentially going down the route of central bank digital going well i think that that that's um you know, when you, when, you, when you think about the central bank digital currency system, for me, it has to be delivered on the back of a, of a substantially painful um, um, asset price environment. You know, they can't really just bring it in willy-nilly. It needs to be brought in as a solution to a problem. So whether it's engineered, whether it's natural, you know, I don't want to be too, um, you don't want to go too far 
into that. Um, obviously, I had my own opinions. Mm. But um, I think that that assuming this this natural assumption that there's a um, that there's a flaw in terms of pain threshold that will always be supported by more printing and more looseness is is a dangerous assumption. Okay. Um, and so stocks aren't crashing yet, you say. So as a result of that and what you've just said, there's potential for a much deeper correction in stock markets. Where does that leave? Where does that leave the bond markets? How does the yield curve behave in that scenario then? Well, I'm you know I'm not an, I'm not a, I'm not a fixed interest investor. So again, and I have plenty of colleagues who are. I'm going to be too. I don't want to be too um, predictive in my in my view on the yield curve. But what I would say is that you know there is a there is a scenario here which is definitely possible whereby we have to go through material pain in both areas. So in other words people are seriously going to need to find something else to own, mm. which will go up when both fixed interest and equities are going through the rinser. Now, obviously, you know, I would say that I, I've been a very long-term gold and silver investor. Mm. And I've been very focused on risk for a very long time, systemic risk. But um, I think it's going to be very few places to hide in a conventional portfolio if the central bank of the world, the Fed, continues to present itself as, as determined to do ongoing interest rate hikes. I mean, if there's still another, you know, even six to eight this year, then I think that that has fairly um, uncomfortable implications for mm -hmm. both bond markets and, and you know, the, the broader equity market. So that brings us then and ultimately to, to gold and silver. Uh, we've got, at the moment, we've got kind of high inflation. We've negative real yields, significantly negative real yields. Uh, we've increased geopolitical tension. Uh, the everything bubble is crashing or bursting or deflating. Um, and there's massive increase in uncertainty. I mean, this is, this is a perfect storm really for gold and silver now, isn't it? Well, so I think that the answer lies somewhere in what you said there. So when you said that we have substantially negative real yields, you know, the, 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 the thing to realize is that we do front end. So if you look at where inflation is versus where rates are, mm -hmm. your, your one year return holding cash is deeply negative. And I mean, you know, it doesn't take a genius to see that. Mm -hmm. But that's also one of the reasons why people find gold sort of a bit annoying at the moment, because they look at that and they think, well, surely we should be going straight up at this point on that basis. But actually, gold and silver live in a market where you, you use sterling and euros and whatever else to pay your bills. Um, you know, Gresham's law will always dictate that you're going to use bad money. So you're going to, you're going to, so front end, gold doesn't, is a bit of an irrelevance. It's not about that. You know, you're always paying your bills and you're thinking about your cash flows in, 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 in bad money rather than in good money. So real rates and gold really is a subject, and silver, by the way, is a subject for sort of seven to 10 years out. Now, this is the reason why gold and silver haven't moved much so far, is because while front end, you know, inflation where it is, rates where they are, surely, like, surely, surely. But remember that, what the Fed has done has been very clever about managing expectations further out. So further out, they're telling you, oh, but we'll have done all of these rate hikes. Yeah. And further out, they're saying the inflation won't be there. Yeah. So, so further out, you know, gold and silver, which is where price discovery takes place in gold, it doesn't take place front end, doesn't take place, you know, in the, in the, the cash market, as it were. It's about expectations of purchasing power in dollars, euros, and sterling. And for now, they're managing the... The, the fixed interest market relatively successfully in terms of where we'll be in seven to 10 years. So the thing to understand is you're right, of course, it is a very, should be a, an optimal macro environment, this, you know, sort of 10 green bottles are all lined up on the wall. But the thing to understand is the price discovery component happens seven to 10 years out and not front end. So until that shifts and it would likely be, um, you know, a pivot, assuming mm -hmm. that does happen. So if they suddenly go, well, hold on, right, we can't do all these rate hikes, or or let's say oil goes through 150, 
and you know the inflation goes on yet another leg further then you're going to find in my my view you're going to find that that um people just sort of hanging on in there in fixed interest allocations particularly will start to go hold on can we really do this and then i think you'll see a wall of money come in um i'm not sure what i said makes sense but but no, absolutely um, let, let, let me see if i got it uh, straight so like let's take inflation at eight percent in the us uh, at the moment and we've got significant um, based on that we've got significant uh, real interest rates at the moment but yeah. that's not what the gold and silver market looks at it looks at the expect it looks at the expected real interest rates forward and sure. what we've got at the moment is we've got basically we've a yield curve that or we've got interest rates that have uh, increased further out the curve a good bit over the last couple of months but what yeah. we've done is there's a managing of the expectation of the inflation rate down right down further right and, and rates up and rates up so we're closing that closes the gap that closes right. the gap that's very apparent today yeah so what they're doing is forward they're they're, they're, they're through through language they, they manage you this way so that out here is oh there's no problem yeah and that's why gold and silver haven't broken out yet um it's because for the, for the time being that narrative is maintained and it can only be maintained as a as a narrative because we have we've got uh, a, a definite number as to what inflation is now but we have no definite number of what inflation is going to be in seven years' time. It's just an expectation. It's and the sorcery of forward guidance. That's right. Right. So as long as the um, as long as the Fed and other central banks can maintain the credibility of that forward projection, then they're maintaining uh, that the, the negative real interest rates are, are are significantly lower than the current negative real interest rates. Is that correct? Yes, and, and and ultimately another way of thinking about this, which might be a little bit more straightforward, but is still, you know, a bit different, is mm. to just remember that that inflation adjusted gold. So if you look at the gold price adjusted for the CPI, so for 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 government statistics, which of course are terrible statistics, but it's mm. what people look at. Um, you'll find that really the gold price in dollars has hit the same level four times, you know since the 70s, once in, in 1980, once in um, 2011, once in 2020, and once this year. And what, so the, what that is, is sort of um, the reality of that, of course, is the gold doesn't move. What's happening is it's, it's the dollar going down mm. four times. So down, and then back up again, and then down, and then back up again, and then down, and then back up again, and then down, and back up again. But it's always hitting the same level. So in other words, you know, gold price twenty one hundred dollars, inflation adjusted, is the is the floor really, and and they've managed to keep the market happy with dollars at that level, but we break through that, and you're going to get a whole change in in investor behaviour, because people are going to start going, oh, hold on, four dollars now, really, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is really not looking okay, um, and that sea change is a huge sea change for everything because it 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 it's a read across for the risk free, you know, it's a read across for what is risk free, what isn't, you know, how do I think about cash? So there's just so many implications involved with this observation that, you know, until we break out through 2100, which of course isn't really happening, it's just gold, it's just gold, and really we're talking about the dollar breaking down. Um, we're still in that world of forward guidance, and they are maintaining, as you put it, credibility. But it's a much bigger, grander game, even than we're describing. Can I ask you for a moment, actually, what got you interested in gold and silver in the first place? Well, so I, 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 I mean, I was a languages student at uni, um, and I, well, I wasn't interested in finance, um, but I read about the removal of um, legislation put in place after the Great Depression, the Glass-Steagall, uh, legislation which was put in place to stop um, banks from using depositors cash to speculate on their own account so that piece of legislation was put in I think it was 33 I'm not actually mm. sure the exact year and then in 1999 um, the Clinton administration removed this piece of legislation said, no, 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 it's fine now we can do that again it's fine and I just remember reading it thinking <laughs> Really? 
you know, it just completely blew me away that that was what was really going on in finance. Because I suppose at that point in my life, I thought finance was accounting. I didn't really, I just <laughs> thought that that was just what finance was. It was just yeah. accounting. I didn't realize that it was sort of high crimes and misdemeanors in real in real life, you know, um, which is what that to me demonstrably was. It was very obvious to me that this was like what, you know, that is clearly going to cause a huge problem, which it did. Um, so that made me interested in finance. That then made me also, of course, as a result, a skeptic about financial markets. So rather than coming into the market as a believer wanting to make, you know, sterling for myself i came in very kind of um very much sort of let's get the bonnet up and have a look and if you do that and there are people now i'm not far from the only one you know if you do do that then you come across gold very quickly it reveals itself to you if you come in with that skeptical viewpoint you immediately find gold but you can find people who work for decades in finance and they know nothing about gold. They have no it's totally beyond their ken because they've come in simply with the intention of making themselves money. Mm -hmm. And they haven't bothered to think about the structural risks and the, and the true framing of the situation. So I'm um, sorry, that was, again, a very long-winded answer. Right. Um, you also once, uh, I've heard you say, gold and silver, uh, they're not an investment. They're sound money. Um, would you explain that for us? Yeah, I mean, I think silver is a little different, but gold isn't. Gold is to disinvest. So if you if you own gold, what you're doing is you're saying that that relative to your local currency, you don't want to be in anything. You want to be in the corner of the room, sort of hiding. Now, you know that has good implications and bad, depending on how you want to think about it. But really, gold is the risk free. Um, there are all sorts of fairly tiresome books you can read that will show you this if you bother to to read them that it measures goods and services in the same way that sterling doesn't. You know, bearing in mind that sterling, of course, comes from the, a, a pound of sterling silver. Mm. And all these words come from the fact that gold and historically silver were the risk-free. Silver is a bit different now because silver is more, is more like a sort of unruly younger brother, you know, badly behaved and more fun. And, <laughs> and, and, it, and it has a real, real return feel to it. Whereas in my view, gold doesn't. Gold is very much just about measuring goods and services. And if you buy lots, you'll be very disappointed if you think you're making a real return because you won't be. But you also won't be losing money again, or you won't be losing purchasing power against goods and services. What you'll be doing is staying, you're staying in the zero bound. You're, you're on a ship in the high seas. You're not in the water. You're not trying to go fishing. You're not trying to do anything. You're just sat there. Um, and so for me, physical gold is the, just the best way to save. It's the, it's the optimal savings instrument because it's risk-free. Um, but that's all that it is. And it won't turn in, some of the, sometimes I say it won't turn into Superman in your portfolio because it, it isn't that. You know, it's just going to um, stay. And that's, of course, why central banks have huge amounts of it because they know exactly what I've said is true. They know that. It's the it's the beauty of it at the end of the day as well. You know, it's yes, nobody absolutely. it's nobody else's liability. That's the it's true. But but I just make you know I emphasize this point because when I first bought gold, um, and it's twenty years ago now. You know, I didn't know that. I thought it was an investment. Right. Okay. I mean, I still I liked it for the right reasons, which is it felt like the opposite of the ill discipline and dubious behavior of what I was looking at. But I felt like it was an active investment. Hmm. Um, and and you know, I suppose. Maybe ten halfway through the journey, maybe ten years ago, I, I worked realised that of course that's not actually happening at all. It's just zero. You know, after ten years, it bought me the same stuff as when I bought it, and guess what? Another 10, 10 years on, it still buys me the same stuff as it would have done ten years ago. Yeah. Um, so, so it is an important observation that. Yeah, and also in in saying that, it's fulfilling its um, fulfilling its inflation hedge credentials as well on that basis. Yes, I mean, uh, accepting that that word is nobly helpful, inflation, you know, it's um, it's a very loaded term, you know, purchasing power. Purchasing more than, power. More than inflation, yeah. Yeah. Um, and with all of that said then, what would be uh, your typical allocation for gold or gold and silver in, in a typical portfolio that you would suggest? Well, I don't suggest portfolios to anybody anymore. I did used to do that many, many years ago. 
but um, there are plenty of, 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 of studies of portfolio outcomes, which will give you a range of different weightings in physical gold from like 2% to 25, depending on which study you read. So all of course that is really is what else is going into the, the hopper when they're looking at returns. So that all, each study will have different asset classes, you know, all the same. And also they'll be wrapping different amounts of time and coming up with a different mathematical calculation based on that. I mean, my, my personal answer is you can't really rely on any of this because it's all um, linear mathematical outputs. So, you know, sure, there's some value in thinking like that, but assuming that that's really telling you anything, assumes that the period that they're looking back over covers all outcomes, which of course is never the case. You know, in any individual time frame you look at even a hundred years, it doesn't it doesn't capture what's really going on. And a great way of explaining that point a bit further, by the way, is to think about central bank balance sheet expansion. So if you think about what's happened since 08 and what's gone on central bank balance sheets in the last 10 years, all backward looking analysis of portfolio outcomes fail to take into account what's happened there. So in other words, what they're, te what they're telling you is, is, is backward looking and it doesn't have any understanding or knowledge or factor in any way, the fact that central banks have gone completely, you know, do lally in the last 10 years, because that hasn't shown up anywhere yet. Therefore it's not in the output. Therefore it's not being factored into your, your weighting. So, so the answer is firstly, every client is different. Every client is a different, investment profile, risk profile, you know, what blend of assets they already own. You know, there is genuinely no single answer to your question. And you can hang your hat on various different backward looking, you know, bits of analysis. But I think that the, the, the question comes down to what is my, as an individual, what is my net worth? So we all have a, you have a sense of what your pie chart would be or what my net worth is, it's, you know, 100 quid or whatever it is. And what proportion of that do you want to be in the risk-free, which in my view is physical gold. So that's sterling, you know, here in London, sterling denominated gold, maybe for you, euro denominated, whatever it might be. Um, and then what proportion do you want to be in active investments outside of that? And I don't think there is a really a single answer to it. It, it will totally depend on the individual, um, what else they own and how they think about, you know, risk and reward and you also have a keen eye on mining stocks as well and the whole mining industry how do they perform over in this environment going going forward well look if you do the backward looking analysis terribly badly um you know you wouldn't invest in them ever but this is kind of the point which is where we've been since certainly since 1971 is a very anomalous period in human history. We've been in a, in a, in a pure fiat money, confidence-based petrodollar system. And that of course is everyone's recorded memory of financial markets. Mm. Now during that period, you know, one of the best possible asset classes you could have been invested in was financials. So the things that are, that are doing the fiat banking. And certainly they've done a hell of a lot better than gold and silver mining equities have. But I tend to think of those two things as quite, um, you know, inversely correlated because, you know, financials are, are exposed to the credit cycle and to, to real rates and to the yield curve. And they, they, they are a sort of form of financial rent. And while they do well, gold miners don't do well. But equally, when the cycle goes against the business model of the banks, uh, and the financial system, what's happening then is that the gold miners will start, should start to deliver enough free cash flow. Now, we, I haven't seen this in my career yet. And until we go through that $2,100 level, by the way, you won't see it. But when that happens, you're very likely to see a substantial move. Then these companies will be throwing off free cash flow sufficient to, um, to grow, which they can't do at the moment, but then also start to pay substantial dividends. And then, you know, there'll be a whole different proposition than there have been in my career. So based on what I've seen and any of you lot have seen, awful, don't own them. Um, but if you want to think in a little bit more in a forward way, then I think there's lots of potential um, in the right sizing, of course. You know, you, you, you'd have to have a very high 
risk profile to want to go big um, on those. Decent risk appetite. Um, just before I wrap up, I want to ask you one question that I've asked of, uh, of a lot of guests. If we look at the US, because uh, it, it, it dominates the financial landscape, um, we've got inflation uh, north of 8%, um, and we've got the Fed trying to increase rates and having a significant impact on financial markets. And they, they, they feel like they're kind of, they look like they're painting themselves or they have painted themselves into a corner. If you were in Jerome Powell's shoes, what would you do? Well, I would never allow myself to be in Jerome Powell's shoes. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I think I would be looking to hand over the reins to someone else. That would be, that would be my, my simple answer. Get out of Dodge. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and quite similar to what a lot of other guests have actually said really? as well. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on Goldcore TV. Don't, don't see it. It's a pleasure. I'm happy to do it again in the future. Super. We'll have you back. Cheers. So there you have it from the investment world. Gold isn't an investment asset, but rather the optimal savings instrument. It's sound money. This is something that we often speak to clients about, especially those who check in with the price on a daily basis and worry about their returns. It's important to remember, as Ned says, that to invest in gold is to disinvest. You don't own gold to make a profit. You own gold because it stays in your portfolio, protecting you over the long term from decisions that are being made right now by central banks and governments alike. If you enjoyed this interview, then may we point you in the direction of another brilliant interview we carried out last year with financial journalist Dominic Frisby. He also believes central banks are fully committed to bringing their own digital currencies to market. And he discusses the impact that this will have on individuals. It's definitely worth a listen. Thank you for joining us today on Goldcore TV. And we'll see you next time when we are going to be interviewing Don Durrett, the expert gold and silver mining analyst. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And be sure you don't miss any of our conversations with Don and other market-leading experts, commentators, and investors. Mm -hmm.